You ever dream of that warm, rich, pure tube sound, but without dropping thousands of dollars? In this video, I'm gonna show you how to build a budget-friendly 2A3 single-ended trialed amplifier that punches way above its weight. You'll be surprised how good a sound you can get even if you're on a tight budget. My name is Mike, thanks for clicking this video. Welcome to my shop. The 2A3 is a directly heated trial designed in the 1930s. It's prized for its linearity and low distortion. It has that classic single-ended magic. You just have to listen to it to truly understand. At only three or four watts a channel, you'd be surprised how good it sounds even driving some low efficiency speakers. Now commercially available 2A3s cost several thousands of dollars, but I think we can make a good sounding one for a fraction of the cost. So with this build, I'm going to go with the proven circuit. So back in the 1990s, way before the internet, there was a pure article called Sound Practices. And in issue 9 of Fall in 95, there was an article in there called Build a Baby a Gonku. Uh, go find the article, have a read, it's pretty interesting. Many people have built this amplifier, but the interesting thing I think about that build is that it uses hard to find pricey output transformers and solar capacitors. I think that we could downgrade those parts and still get a pretty good sounding amplifier using that classic circuit. We'll have a quick look at the circuit. 12AT7 for the input and driver. We cap coupled to the 2A3. We'll be utilizing a single ended transformer and an AR4 tube rectifier. So let's look at some of the components here. The power transformer, we're gonna be using the Hammond 276X. It's a 640 volt center tap at 173 milliamps. Uh, it's a pretty skookum transformer. This should supply more than enough current for both the left and right channel. This transformer does not come with a 2.5 volt winding. So to power the 2A3's filaments, we need a separate transformer. So this is the Hammond 166M2. It's 2.5 volts at three amps. And for the choke, we're going to be doing the Hammond 159R. It's 6 Henry at 200 milliamps. And staying in the Hammond theme, we're going to be using the Hammond multi tap output transformer. So this is a 125 CSE. It's 8 watts rated at 60 milliamps. I've used these in the past and they sound pretty good. Separate different types of winding so you can choose different primary and secondary um, impedances. So all the tubes in this amplifier will be from the Horizon series and the Horizon series is considered more of their budget friendly tube set. The 1287 here looks like a standard 1287 but it has some extra internal bracing there. So I suspect that might help with microphonics. The 2A3 here um, is quite stout. Uh, the envelope at size is almost the size of a 300B. Uh, most 2A3s that I've seen are quite a bit smaller than this, so that's interesting. And for the 5AR4, this is a new release from them on the Horizon series. So I'm interested to see how the actual voltage drop compares to new old stock 5AR4s. So let's go do a chassis design here. So this will be the layout of the top plate. The dimensions are 10 by 18. And I'm going to do it lengthwise like this. So the power tubes and input tubes will be up front here and the transformers will be in the back. So with the power transformer, we'll put it in the back corner here, try to keep it away from everything. Uh, well, with the choke here, we'll put it underneath and we'll let it hang down. And for the output transformers, we'll mount them here and we want to make sure that the windings from the power transformer and the output transformer are perpendicular to each other so it doesn't do any induction there. And the tube sockets for the 2A3 we'll put here. Input tubes will go here. The rectifier tube socket will put back here. And then we'll have the little filament transformers and I'm going to decide to put them closer to the 2A3 tubes. So we'll do something like that. And again, they're perpendicular to that. To help keep the runs really short for the input section, we will put the RCA's incoming there. And for the switch, I'll mount it in back here. Since these transformers are a little bit unsightly, what I'll do is we'll make some covers to stick over top of that. So I previously made these covers knowing that I'd be building an amplifier like this using these transformers. So these will just slide over top like that. And they're more for decorative looks. They're basically made out of wood and there's really nothing for shielding. I guess you could line some tape in here if you wanted to. So 
So with some poster board and some tape, I did a mock-up of my amplifier chassis, a CAD cardboard aided design. I like to do this before I switch over to the full metal version, just to make sure there's room for everything, everything clears, everything fits in, and I can actually get everything and solder everything together. Now there is some inspiration from those classic audio note amplifiers. This 2A3 amplifier that I'm building is sort of a nod to that, so it would be fitting to do something similar as well. Now, if you didn't have all the metal work and fabrication skills, you could basically build this amplifier on a wood base with a loom top plate. I've built many amplifiers like this. It works great and you don't need a lot of tools other than a drill and maybe some punches. Just did a quick mock-up with the tube sitting on top of the cardboard chassis. See the rectifier tube popping out the back there. I like this color scheme, so I think I'm gonna do something similar. So a white top, black transformer covers and black sides. So I'm back from the metal store, have all the parts required to make the chassis. So for the back and sides, we'll be using this eighth of an inch by three inch steel flat bar. For the top plate, we'll be using this 14 gauge steel and I'll bend and form the front angle piece to it. And that top plate will be bolted to the sides. And to give it a nice clean look, we're gonna recess the tube sockets below the top plate and I'll be mounting the tube sockets on this 14 gauge aluminum. And to give it extra rigidity, I have this aluminum angle and that will be mounted underneath as well. And I'll also be mounting the hump pots for the 2A3s on that so they don't protrude out the top to give it a nice clean look. So off camera, I finished off all the fabrication of the chassis here. So what's left to do is just figure out the standoff locations on the inside and of course paint the chassis. I think it turned out pretty good. I really like the look of this. And the transformer covers that I made. It does a nice job of concealing these transformers and gives it a nice polished look. So I got all the major components installed and most of the layout all figured out here. Got the standoffs installed. So I got the choke mounted on the side, the rectifier tube. This would be the power supply section here. I have the filament transformers for the 2A3, the hump pots here, the 2A3 sockets, and then the input tubes mounted there. And off to the side would be the incoming RCAs. So what's left to do now is pull all it apart uh, paint it and start the wiring. The paint is all cured and I started mounting all the components here. So I have the bottom plate is a modular design. So I have all the tube sockets on the front section. Those are all mounted with the terminal strips. I have the middle section that holds the hump pots and the filament transformers. And then I have the rear section that holds all the power supply. And I mounted the choke on the side there and some more standoffs. So we want to make sure that the grommets are in place where any pass-throughs go. So I have some on the middle section there and on the top plate here I also have where the output transformer goes through and the power transformer in the back there goes through. So nice grommets there, no sharp edges. So for all the fasteners I'm using these hex key button heads mixed for a nice clean look. 
So I typically use 6x32 for most of the chassis. Uh, mounting transformers and other things with bigger holes, I'll use 8x32. They have a nice clean look and they come with an Allen key. For nuts, I typically go with a nylon lux so nothing vibrates loose. And if you don't want to go with that, you should have something like a lock washer or the star washers as well. Let's take a look at some initial wiring. What I first like to do is bond all the frames of the transformers. So our filament transformers, our output transformers, our choke and our power transformer. We're gonna bond the frames to a star point here and that star point here goes back to the safety ground on the incoming AC. I tidied up all the loose wires and kind of zap strapped them all together. And then we also went ahead and wired the speaker connections to the speaker jacks. So the next point here would be to do all the grounding and bonding. So I got all the grounding, bus work and filament wires all in. So before we go any further by installing any components, I'll go ahead and check the resistance. Make sure that we have connectivity in all the ground plane. So I just go through and make sure we have no bad solder joints. So I have a quick look at the tools and the wire I'm using. So for the main hookup wire, I'm using the 22 gauge solid core PVC wire. The reason why I like this is it trains really nice and then when you heat it up with a soldering gun, it doesn't deform the jacket too much. For the solder, we're going with the Kester's 6040. It is 0 0.031 of an inch or 0 0.8 millimeters. Uh, for the soldering station, I'm going with the Haku 936 and with the wand, it is the 907. I've been really happy with this, been running this for years. It's a great station. So I got most of the wiring done and before I install the pass components, I have a quick look at the layout here. So we have the incoming signal through some shielded wires and the shielding is bonded to a ground stud here that's directly to the chassis. We have the left and right channel bonding is separated each other and it only connects back to the star ground. I have the incoming 6.3 heater winding for the input tubes and that's all shielded and any of the signal wires that cross over that is perpendicular to each other. We have the B plus coming from the power supply section around this side so it's nicely separated. We have the hum pots mounted and the filaments for the 2A3s all wired up back to the filament transformers because the power transformer here does not have the 2.5 filament windings. So our power transformers mounted under here, we have our high voltage lines coming out to the rectifier tube and of course the center tap to the grounding of the power supply section. We have the five volt filament windings to the rectifier tube and then we have the 6.3 coming up to the shielded wire and then the center tap of the 6.3 is going to the voltage divider network. We don't want to exceed the heater to cathode rating on these 12 AT7s due to the SRPP topology. So before we install all the pass components, now is a really good time to see if the three filament circuits and the high voltage winding on the transformer actually have voltage. So I have the amplifier plugged into my light bulb current sink and I have my multimeter hooked up to AC voltage there. And at first we're going to check the input tubes. Everything's plugged in, so we'll flick the switch on the current sink. We have voltage there, 118 volts at the light bulb sink there. Let's flick the amplifier on. Right on, so we have 6.9 volts unloaded at the tubes, so that will come down when we put tubes in. The 2.5 voltage here. So unloaded is 2.8 volts, so that all checks out. So on the rectifier tube, we have 5.4 volts unloaded, so that all inspect. At the high voltage, we have 641 volts uh, AC unloaded, so it looks like it's all in spec. So I got the rest of the components installed, ready to put the tubes in, turn the amp on, and do some testing. So for the input tubes there, I have their grid resistors installed, I have the cathode resistors, the bypass caps, and the separate filter supply caps just for the input tubes. I have some high quality RE caps for the coupling caps. The bias resistors and bypass caps are installed, stood off so that it gets lots of air circulation. Power supply section in the back here, 
Got those all installed and the voltage divider network for the 6.3 heater windings all installed. So we're ready to plug the tubes in and fire the amp up and do some testing and see how it sounds. So we're ready to insert the tubes now and do some testing. I'm not going to install the rectifier tube yet because I don't want to apply any B plus to the circuit. I want to validate that the filament voltage on the normal tubes are working properly. On these two A3s, the bigger prongs are the filament ones. So you want to make sure that they go into the bigger holes and don't force it otherwise or else you ruin the tubes. Okay, so we'll tilt it up so we can access the chassis and do some testing. So we've got the amp hooked up to the light bulb current sink just in case we have any shorts. The light comes on, we know we have an issue. So let's click that on. We're reading 118, 19 volts on my current sink and let's turn the amplifier on. And we can see that the two A3s are drawing 2.5, 2.6 volts. So that seems to be in spec. We'll measure the other one. So the two A3s are drawing their filament voltage and current. So let's check the 12 AT7s now. Turn that on. So as they warm up, it will kind of come down a bit. Uh, it is a little bit high, so we'll probably need to address that in the near future. But it looks like everything is drawing appropriate voltage. It's time to check the B+. Uh, I've got my shortening plug, so we'll put those on the inputs. I've got the speakers plugged in because we're going to put some load on the output transformer. And then I'm going to install the rectifier tube. So that's good to go. Now I have a multimeter on the B+, so let's turn on the current sink. So we're waiting for the rectifier tube to warm up. And once it warm up, we should start seeing B+. Okay, everything checks out there. So I'll do some more final voltage test and we'll add my preamp and we'll listen to some music. While the voltage is checked out, we're ready to listen to some music. I have my iPhone connected to my preamp. If you're interested in this preamp, I do have a full build video for that as well. And my shop speakers are some 8 inch full range. So I say that's a success. What I'll do is I'll remove this and put this into my main system and we'll put a high resolution source onto it. So this is the final schematic here and I'll put a link in the description below. So the B plus turned out to be 380 volts and the other side of the choke was 362 volts, which is their overall current draw of about 120 milliamps. I modeled this on the Duncan Amps power supply designer and the voltages turned out to be exactly what I'm reading on the amp. So that's pretty cool. So on the voltage divider for the filament supply, I'm reading 74 volts and that will help us elevate the filaments of the 12 AT7. So on the 12 AT7s here, I'm reading 1.88 volts and that gives us 5 milliamps of current draw. And on the node between the 12 AT7 and the two A3s, we're reading 165 volts. So on the two A3s here, we're reading 351 volts at the plate. 54 volts at the cathode, which gives us about 54 milliamps of current draw. So that works out to 16 watts of dissipation. And that's a conservative rating, so that will give us some tube longevity. And with the shortening jacks on the input, I'm measuring 2.1 millivolts of AC on the output. And that does equate to a little bit of hum, but you can only really hear it when your ear is close to the speaker. I've been auditioning this amplifier for a couple days now, and I must say, this little amplifier sure delivers that classic set sound. It has rich mids, detailed sound stage, and for only 3 watts, it can sure fill the room. Even with its low parts count and a rudimentary topology, it makes me believe that the magic is in these two A3 tubes. Now, I did deviate a little bit from the original schematic in the article, so I'll put a link in the description below for the schematic I use, a bill of material, and also a build document of some different things you could do with this amplifier, like different rectifier tubes and different output transformers. I run this with a subwoofer, so I don't really care too much about the low bass extension, but if you didn't have a subwoofer, you probably want to get some better output transformers, something like the original MagnaQuest ones, or even the Edcore ones. And I'll put a link in the description below of what else would work for this amplifier. If you like this build and want me to do a deeper dive into this amplifier, please leave a comment below and perhaps I can do another video. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.